I said, um, I Are you trying this okay? Yes, we can see your slide. Yes. Um, yes, you may unshare first. Thank you. Mario, we can start now, right? All right, so good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2023 Paasa, Paasa monthly webinar series with this month's theme on good health and well being. I am Gladys Completo from the Institute of Chemistry, University of the Philippines, Los Banos, and currently the Vice President of Paase. The Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering, or PAASE in short, is a nonprofit organization composed of scientists and engineers of Philippine descent who have distinguished themselves in scholarly and research related activities. PAASE members are at the forefront of scientific research and technology development in the United States, the Philippines, and other countries. Our mission is to contribute to national progress through the improvement of the STEM ecosystem in the Philippines. Without further ado, I would like to call on our PAASA president, Dr. Mario Santo Domingo, currently the Associate Director for Evaluation and Research for the Meyerhoff Scholars Program at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, to give the opening remarks. Mario? Maraming salamat, uh, Dr. Gladys Completo. Uh, so uh, I'm the president of PAASE and I'm a social scientist. So uh, I would like to welcome uh, everyone to the first ever uh, PAASE webinar this year. So uh, uh, PAASE, as uh, Dr. Gladys mentioned, is a uh, global organization. It is composed of almost or, or a, li a, a little more than 600. Uh, full and associate uh, members who are mostly uh, 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 PhDs. Uh, we uh, have uh, 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 members who uh, come from uh, many different uh, uh, categories of the sciences, life sciences, physical sciences, social sciences, and many integrative areas you know, of research uh, and uh, teaching. Uh, so, uh, one of the major thrusts of uh, PAASE is uh, education. And under education, of course, uh, are uh, the uh, uh, conduct of uh, webinars and fireside chats. So webinars are basically uh, presentations on research findings, discoveries, and uh, major uh, 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 trends while well, firstly uh, conversations about issues relative to science and technology and all attendant uh, you know uh, uh, issues you know uh, around the uh, SNT and research and development. Uh, last year we had uh, more than uh, uh, two dozens uh, webinars and uh, around uh, ten fireside chats. So if you go to our website paase.org p a a s e dot o r g you will find an archive of these uh, webinars and fireside chats. Uh, we would like to uh, also draw your attention to uh, the many offerings that we have for this year. Actually, uh, we have, uh, of course, one tonight, one on Monday, which is co-sponsored uh, uh, with the UP Medical Alumni uh, 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 in America. Uh, so, uh, we would also like to draw your attention, you know, when you visit our uh, website, to uh, our uh, journal, the SciNJ. SciNJ or Science and Engineering Journal is a Scopus indexed journal where you can submit uh, your uh, manuscripts for uh, publication. And finally, I would like to invite everyone to the uh, 43rd uh, annual Paase meeting and symposium which will be uh, held on site in Orlando, Florida, but then we have an online segment, you know, 
prior to the on-site uh, uh, conference. This will happen on uh, June 27 and 28, the online component, and the on-site uh, 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 meeting will be on the 28th to the 29th and thir the 30th. So uh, uh, please uh, visit our uh, website again, paase.org, P-A-A-S-E.org, to learn more about Paase. You are welcome to ask us questions. You are welcome to uh, 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 send us uh, any uh, inquiries about the uh, opportunities for learning, and we will be gladly uh, resp responding to your questions. Maraming salamat po at magandang uh, gabi mula dito sa Baltimore. Magandang umaga po dyan sa Pilipinas. Salamat po. Thank you, Mario. So now I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, Fred, can you share uh, the PowerPoint, please? Okay, and the next one. Okay, so good morning, everyone. I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Todd Lowry. So he received his BA in chemistry from the University of Montana and his PhD in organic chemistry from the University of Alberta. He did two postdoctoral stints at the University of Alberta and Carlsberg Laboratory. And he started his independent academic career in the Department of Chemistry at the Ohio State University as an assistant professor and in 2002 was promoted to associate professor with tenure. A year later, he returned to the University of Alberta, retiring in 2021 as the RU Lemieux Professor of Carbohydrate Chemistry. And in 2019, he became a distinguished research fellow at the Institute of Biological Chemistry at Academia Sinica in Taipei, Taiwan, a position he continues to hold. He has several research interests, but particularly in carbohydrate chemistry and biochemistry in relation to bacterial glycans. He it has a particular focus on glycans from mycobacteria, including mycobacterium tuberculosis and campylobacter jejuni. He is a fellow of the American Chemical Society, the American Association for the Advancements of Science, and the Royal Society of Canada. Without further ado, I would like to call on Dr. Todd Lowry, my PhD mentor and a good friend. Todd, please. Okay, thanks, Gladys. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so let me share my slides again. And uh, okay, so you should be able to see them all now, I hope. Yes, you um, can share. Okay, can you see everything? The presentation mode, please. Yep, there we go. Thank you. Be okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So, so thanks, Gladys, for the opportunity to give uh, this webinar. Um, it's nice to connect with uh, uh, the Filipino community. Always nice to connect with the Filipino community. Uh, in fact, I just got back from a couple of days in the Philippines, as you're aware. So, um, so I'd like to share with you some work we've been doing over the last um, several years. On, on uh, a second here on uh, related to microbacterial disease and, and, and trying to understand more about the glycans or the carbohydrates that this organism produces and hopefully being able to try to even use those, uh, that understanding to try to improve uh, diagnostics. And uh, what I wanna talk about today also is, is some a new kind of recent extension of this project into, into uh, phages, or which are viruses that infect uh, microbacteria. So uh, TB, of course, is an important disease, although uh, th there are actually a large number of different mycobacterial species, and so there's nearly 200 of them. Most of them are, are not, not at all harmful. They, they live in the soil, and they really have no uh, effect on human health. There are some, however, that are important uh, health, uh, health uh, issues, and so one of them is, uh, of course, mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes TB. Uh, mycobacterium leprae, which causes the, the disease leprosy, or what's now referred to as Hansen's disease. And mycobacterium avium is another example, which is a, an important uh, disease uh, or infection that, that imp impacts largely people with compromised immune systems. 
So TB is a is a is the world's most lethal bacterial disease. It's the 13th leading leading cause of death worldwide. Uh, and until COVID came along, it was actually the the single largest uh, uh, disease that caused death related to infections. And so now COVID has displaced that and is now it's now number two. So it's estimated that about a world a third of the world's population is infected with TB. Um, and that sounds like a very scary number, but most of those individuals have what's called latent TB. So that is, they don't that their immune system can keep the organism in, in check, uh, and that it um, um, uh, that it, it doesn't you can't spread it if you have latent TB. And so it's only if, if, for example, your immune system becomes weakened that you'll start to develop active form of the disease. And so again, as, as I mentioned, there are about one to two million people every year die from tuberculosis. So there's been renewed interest in the treatment and diagnosis of the disease due to its resurgence in the industrialized world and also the emergence of drug resistance strains. And uh, um, and so uh, that's some of the, the, the impetus for, for increased interest. In addition, there are a number of what are called non-tuberculosis mycobacteria, or NTMs, uh, which are, uh, again, in fact, largely immunocompromised people. Um, but these are also becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, and so there's, there's an interest in trying to better understand these diseases as well. So if we think about TB in the context of, of, of sort of the, the period in which we live, which of course is defined by the, the COVID pandemic, um, certainly I think uh, COVID has, has underscored the, the threat of infectious disease and what, what it can do to our society. Um, it's also, I think, highlighted how important it is to have rapid and accurate diagnostics, diagnostics for, for, for various diseases. And <clears throat> because of the, the diversion of resources from other areas to COVID, uh, the goals by the World Health Organization to, to really dramatically reduce the burden of TB, uh, which they had thought they could achieve by 2030, uh, that's all being slowed down now. And basically, they think that they're at least 10 years behind now in terms of trying to, to control, uh, better control the disease. So the, the milestones they set to achieve by 2030 now are, are not going to be reachable. Okay, so if you think about tuberculosis, one of the hallmarks of the disease is that it's very difficult to treat. And so if you are um, uh, given, it, uh, if you get TB, then you're given a cocktail of antibiotics for about six months, sometimes longer. And the standard regimen uh, for TB is about uh, roughly 500 pills. And so that's a lot of antibiotics to be taking over a long period of time. And the reason for that is that this organism has a very uh, unique cell wall structure. And so um, most of you are probably familiar with uh, what, what gram-negative bacteria and gram-positive bacteria. Uh, mycobacteria are actually different from those in that they, it's sort of a third type of, of organism and the structure of it is shown here. So it has a layer of, 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 of uh, uh, peptidoglycan that's adjacent to the cell membrane. There's uh, a large structure on top of that called the mycolylarabinogalactin complex, which is a large uh, polysaccharide contained attached then to lipids. And it's actually this lipid barrier here that prevents the passage of antibiotics into the organism. It's a very densely packed form of lipid layer. At the periphery of this, uh, this cell wall structure, then, are a number of different carbohydrates. And so uh, predominantly a molecule called lipoarabinomannan, or LAM, and a delipidated form called arabinomannan, uh, an alpha-glucan, and also a family of uh, extractable glycolipids. And so today, what I want to focus on really is this, this part here out of the outer surface. And in particular, I'm going to focus really on, on uh, just one of these species, and it's called LAM, or the, the, the delipidated form of arabinomannan. So I'm, on the next slide, I'm going to show you a little more detail about what this lamb molecule looks like. Um, so this is a, a cartoon depiction of the molecule. So each of the shapes then is a, is a monosaccharide residue or sugar residue. And so there are basically three overall domains of this. There's the menin domain, there's the arabin domain, and then the caps. Uh, can you turn yeah. on your video? Of me? Yes, your video is off. Okay, there we go. All right, okay. All right, um, hang on. Okay, all right. Um, so the mannan then is made up of a series of, of, of one six link mannopyranose residues. So the sugar residues are in the six member ring form. And then the arabinin then is defined by these types of structures where you have arabinose in the five member ring form. And this is, these have linear stretches, but are occasionally branched. And at the end of the arabinin then are domains like this. There's what's called era four and era six. And you can see that these are closely related. This one basically just lacks this, the side chain here uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the larger molecule. 
and then the cap center attached to these hydroxyl groups here. And I'll show you the structures of these in the next slide, but these are, are actually species specific. And the one I show here is actually one that contains this molecule MTX, which I'll show in the next slide. And so these are examples of capping motifs. And so uh, in the case of TB boas, which is a cattle disease, uh, uh, avium, which I've already mentioned at lepre, uh, these are uh, mannose oligo short mannose containing oligosaccharides. In the case of TB and Kansasai, then this is um, this is a uh, mannose linked to then uh, this very unusual MTX residue, which is a 5-thiomethyl uh, xylofuranose residue. So this is an unusual sugar. It has a sulfur here. Uh, and this is the only place in nature that this, this, this monosaccharide is actually found. Organisms that are not pathogenic, for example, smegmatis, fortuitum, and, and colony either have an acetophosphate cap, so they're not capped at all. And so there's kind of a range of, of different structures here. So um, it's known that these glycans that are produced in this outer portion of the cell wall are actually quite important from an immunological perspective. They're ligands for the, the lectins of the innate immune system, so they're involved in the innate, innate immune response. Uh, it's known that as well that lamb in particular is a very potent inducer of antibodies. And so if you're ever infected with TB, you'll have large quantities of, of lamb, uh, any lamb antibodies that you can produce. But really a molecular level of understanding of these roles is, is, is really lacking. So we don't have a good appreciation for structures of, of what structures or motifs in these molecules actually are responsible for the observed immune effects. And to give you an example of this, um, there are a number of anti-lamb anti monoclonal antibodies that are known, but uh, until the work I'm going to tell you about today, which we completed, being com completed over the last couple of years, uh, we really only stood the specificity for, for one of them, which was a, 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 a which was a monoclonal antibody called CS35. And so this was a study we published now more than 10 years ago, where we had, uh, did, had a crystal structure of the protein here, which is shown at the bottom of the slide. Um, then attached then to its ligand, this this uh, this um, um, this uh, error six hexasaccharide. Okay. So our goal was to try to better understand this um, uh, and develop tools then that would perhaps speed up our ability to study these things. And so we decided to set off and develop a glycan array uh, of the structures. And so the idea was to identify a series of, of targets um, that were that were um, that we could use uh, to produce then a family of synthetic uh, TB cell wall glycans, and then once we had those, we would print them on arrays. So these are basically small glass slides that contain then the sugar molecules, and so then this would then allow us to do ELISA type assays using various proteins or any sort of receptors that bound to these molecules and to, to enable structure function studies. So our idea was then to actually make an array of, of, of 72, 75 different glycans and they uh, com composed predominantly of lamb, but then there were some other of, of these structures, which I didn't mention today, which I, I will skip over today. But basically the, the plan was to really develop a large number of different uh, fragments here. Um, we're not quite there yet. We've got uh, something with 72 glycans. And so we're, we're, we're approaching the, 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 the target, although we've since expanded and wanted to, to now make even larger numbers of these glycans. So if you think about doing something like this, you, you, you really could think about two different ways of doing it. So one is to, to use chemistry to make all of these, which is the approach we've taken. The other would be to try to isolate these materials from, from nature. So we've employed chemistry because we think it's a, we, we think there's some, some important advantages, although there's, there are also some limitations. So one of the advantages, of course, of a synthetic approach is that you can you can um, make molecules that you know the structure, you can characterize them using various spectroscopic methods, and you typically can get them in, in overall purity that's higher than what you see from, from nature. Uh, you can also make fragments of these larger structures, which allows you to probe uh, structure activity relationships better. Um, and you can access milligram or if you need to really even gram quantities of compounds and doing that using uh, using uh, natural uh, isolation is actually really, really challenging. It also allows you to generate molecules then that have uh, groups that allow you to say tag them or put fluorescent probes on or um, or uh, attach things to surfaces or, or attached to a protein, for example, if you want to generate an antibody. So those are the advantages. The disadvantage, of course, is that, that doing synthesis is, is labor intensive and it requires a lot of technical expertise to do this. Uh, and to give you sort of an indication that the work, this array that I'm going to tell you about probably took about 200 man years of work. And by that, I mean, uh, we made these compounds over about 20 years or so. 
Uh, and we had roughly on average about 10 people a year working on that. So it was really a, a big under, undertaking. Um, and then the other thing is that you, you can't just make molecules, you have to know what to make. And so the, what we do is then we rely on uh, structural information that's being provided in the literature by people who are then understanding or trying to, to isolate these molecules from, from bugs and determine their structures. <coughs> Excuse me. There's there's a lot of interest now in using enzymes to make to make molecules, uh, in particular carbohydrates. Um, the problem with using an approach to make these types of molecules is that um, we really don't have a, a good enough understanding yet of the enzymes that are involved in putting these molecules together. And so really at this point, um, trying to use those in a, in a very significant way to, to make these molecules is, is really not, a, not an option. Okay, so, so we've used this synthetic approach and on the next slide then, this is uh, the structure of the, the array that we first published and this was published now, I guess, it seems like, it doesn't seem so long ago, but I guess it has been now uh, almost six years. Uh, and so here's the, the structures basically, the, the, again, these are in the cartoon form. And so we're gonna focus then on the lab structures here. Um, so again, these are then uh, uh, molecules that range in size from fairly small, uh, say a tetrasaccharide, the one compound one at the top, two things that are much larger um, involving then um, uh, say things that are as large as 22 carbohydrate, carbohydrate residues. And then there are also other families of glycans, but today I'm gonna to focus only on, on these. And so with the array then we can, we can then uh, go out and, and look at how different proteins interact with these glycans. And we, we focused more re pretty much most recently on, on uh, antibodies to recognize LAM. So I, I already sort of introduced this already that there are high titers of, of if, you're, if you're infected with TB, you, you, you have, uh, or any type of mycobacteria, you have high titers of antibodies against LAM. Uh, the specificity of only one was known before we started this work. And so what we did is we work with we work with individuals from the Foundation for Innovative New, new Diagnostics, which is a, a, a Gates-affiliated NGO that's focused on trying to develop new diagnostics for, for important diseases, as well as scientists at Rutgers University and also uh, scientists at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York to characterize antibodies. And so the, the data that I'm going to share with you today uh, involve these antibodies here. So basically, we, we looked at a series of murine antibodies. Uh, and then antibodies that were obtained from other organisms, other animals, for example, rabbits or chickens, as well as some human antibodies. So those from mice and from, from the other animals then were all generated in the sort of classical way. They were, they, the animals were immunized with the polysaccharide or a conjugate of the polysaccharide. And then uh, the, 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 the hybridomas were gen generated from, the, from, those, from, from those, and then the, those were used to produce the antibodies. In the case of the humans, um, these were all isolated from B cells of TB patients. And so these are in principle then perhaps more, more relevant to people who have actually have had uh, TB disease. And so the data then that we can get uh, is shown here. So basically on, on the left-hand side of the screen, then there are a series of, of graphs. Uh, the the, the, the y-axis then is just a signal. So if you see, a, if, if you get binding, you see a signal. Uh, and then we looked at, and then the x-axis then is the different compounds. Um, and for each, for each protein, we then looked at different concentrations of the, of, of the protein to sort of get a sense of relative affinities. So for each compound, we have in this case, three, uh, three concentrations, 10, one and 0 0.1 micrograms per mil. So what you see is some of these are broadly cross-reactive and some, uh, some actually bind to a relatively focused area of, 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 of uh, structures. So just to look at these structures here, for example, these are these, are these molecules here, which contain only arabinose residues. Um, these molecules here then are generally larger, more complicated in that they bind uh, to molecules that have not only the arabinose, but also some of these capping motifs. And then the ones here, um, which are recognized only by this antibody, are um, linear compounds that contain these capping motifs, inclu including this unusual 5 thiomethyl sugar. So if you look at all of this and ask yourself the question, well, that, that, that's a lot of data there. Is there anything that anything that's common in all of these molecules? Uh, the answer is yes. And so basically it all binds to this structure here, which is this disaccharide motif that contains a beta one or beta one two linked to rabinofurinose, where this OH group is either an OH group or there's some sort of a, a group attached to it. So if you then ask yourself the question, well, how, how really important is that group? Uh, we can get at that by looking at a couple of other compounds that are there are on the array. 
So these two compounds here are related to this molecule, but they lack this key motif here. And what you can see here basically is that these, with the exception of perhaps a little bit of binding here, really don't bind at all to the, to the array. And so this suggests this motif is actually really, really quite critical for binding. So here's some additional data on some of these antibodies. And so this now we've looked at a, a broader range of concentrations. Um, and I'm going to highlight just a couple of these here. So um, the, the one that's perhaps my favorite of all of these uh, is this motif here, or this antibody here, which recognizes a relatively small number of compounds. And what you see is that these, these are the, the, the five compounds that it binds to. Um, these all then contain uh, this MTX motif here. So it seems that that specifically binds onto this group attached to the mannose. This one is one of the ones from humans, and this binds to only three compounds. And it's this motif here that's very specific. So it, it's, in many cases, pretty obvious based on this data what these compounds seem to bind to, although in other cases, it's not as clear. So for example, this uh, antibody binds to things in the core of the lamb, as well as things that are at the termini of the arabinan. And, and so here was would contain the caps. And so these are cases where we try to try to understand what it really is binding to, and it's not obvious. And so um, in some cases, we're actually working with crystallographers and other structural biologists to understand better what the specificities of these antibodies are, are trying to get complexes of the structures with, with uh, these antibodies with, with the molecules. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. So that, that, that's sort of uh, kind of some fundamental basic science work that, that, that uh, uh, has, has, I think, been a lot of fun to work on. Um, the work with FIND that we've been doing, the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, was all ultimately directed at trying to develop better antibodies, uh, better antibodies for uh, use in diagnostics for TB. And so certainly TB diagnostics are important. It's a big market. Um, and there are existing TB diagnostics. Um, the problem with many of them is that they're, 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 they're expensive, uh, they're time consuming and they're many are not readily easy, easily done in developing areas. Um, and so to give you an example, the, the sort of gold standard for, for TB diagnosis is, is, is using bacterial culture that requires someone going to a clinic, uh, producing a sample of sputum, which is a fluid from the lungs. Uh, that's then, then uh, they attempt to grow up uh, the organism in, by using culture. And that process takes about two weeks. So if you're living in, uh, in the developing world and you have to travel two to three hours to go to a clinic, um, and you're, you're, you have to do that twice. Uh, often it's difficult to, to, to get there a second time. And so sometimes people don't get diagnosed accurately and it's also very slow. Um, and then um, perhaps the worst part about some TB diagnostics is they're just really not very reliable. So they're not very good tests. So what's used now uh, commonly uh, is sort of viewed as the, the, the gold standard is, is what's called the gene expert. And so this is a, this is a PCR test, uh, much like, a, like the COVID test we've all been taking over the last uh, several, several years. And again, this uses sputum, which is a, a fluid that comes out of the lungs. Um, and so um, this test costs only about $10, so about uh, five, five, 500 Philippine pesos. Um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually not fully uh, the full cost of the, of the test. Uh, the Gates Foundation actually subsidizes uh, the de subsidized development of this, and so part of the, the 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 deal was that the the company that produces these needs to keep the cost uh, cost reasonable for to access um, to to be to be able to use uh, broadly as possible worldwide. Um, so one of the problems with with this test is it uses sputum, which is not an ideal uh, an ideal, ideal fluid for for diagnosing TB. It can be very difficult to, to get sputum, particularly in children, uh, and it it can't be used to diagnose TB if it's not in the lungs. And so sometimes people get uh, non pulmonary TB, uh, and so um, it's a uh, it can be a challenge then. So if you think about other fluids that that you could use easily, there are probably two that come to mind. One is saliva uh, and the other is urine. And so it turns out there is actually a urine-based TB test that's a lateral flow test um, that is actually available. And so it's called the Allure TB determined lamb test. Sorry, lead determined TB lamb diagnostic. And there's a big caveat here. And so the big caveat is that this is only effective uh, in people who are HIV positive. Um, and in particular for, for people who have uh, rather, rather uh, advanced forms of HIV. Um, and uh, it's believed that this is the case because it's only in people that have 
relatively compromised immune systems that there's enough bacterial growth that there's enough antigen shed into the urine that can be detected. And so um, ideally what we would like to do or what, what the field would like to do would be to develop a better diagnostic that could be broadly applicable to uh, use in, in basically any individual. Um, in particular, and in, in hopefully even those that, that are, are, are uh, well, certainly those that are not HIV positive, but also then those who may even have latent disease. Um, and so the question is really was, could we, uh, could we develop a, a, a more sensitive monoclonal or a, a pair monoclonals perhaps that would be more effective? Um, and so this is, I want to stress, is, is, is work that we've done in collaboration. So uh, the, the sort of clinical work here with the clinical samples is not being done in my lab. It's, it's being done by our collaborators. Uh, and so our, our role here is really just to, to try to define the specificity of these antibodies using RRA. And so basically the, the answer to this question was that we posed was yes. And so we published a series of papers over the last several years uh, where we described this, this, this test. And it's, it's as, as I mentioned, a lateral flow test, which is, um, excuse me, um, like the, the pregnancy tests that are available or the COVID tests that, that we've, again, all the rapid COVID tests that we've all been taking. Uh, so basically the idea is that you, you have your test as a capture antibody you apply your sample to this, the urine sample, that capture antibody then captures the lamb, and then you go in with the detection antibody then that detects the, the presence of the lamb and how you do the detection really, there's a number of ways in which you can do that. So find then evaluated uh, 100 different pairs of capture and detection antibodies. So it's basically those antibodies I told you about as well as several others that I, I didn't show you the data for. And by comparing all those with, with clinical samples of, of TB patients, what they discovered was that the best capture antibody, so the thing that you used to capture the lamb, uh, was this monoclonal here, which is the, the, the one that's my favorite that recognizes this MTX motif. Uh, and then the, the, the best detection antibody was this one here, which is actually a human uh, antibody, uh, which is really broad, broadly cross-reactive over uh, a range of, of different uh, beta-1, 2, RF-containing glycans. So again, once that was developed, uh, I should point out as well that this this uh, this assay was uh, is now being commercialized and further validated, um, and it was it's being it's being generated by by Fujifilm, which is a Japanese company. So you you at least the people who are older in the audience will have heard of Fujifilm because we, we in the old days we used to take pictures using old old school film. Uh, no one does that anymore, and of course uh, that meant that Fujifilm's uh, basically business model fell apart. And so it turns out that they've actually innovated and they've now have a big, they have a big focus on uh, diagnostics. And so to give you a bit more insight on how this works uh, in terms of uh, with actual samples. Um, so if you have a diagnostic, you ideally want a diagnostic that has both high sensitivity and high specificity. So if something is highly sensitive, you, it means it has a low false negative rate. And if it's highly specific, it means it has a low false positive rate. And so ideally, again, you want something that has both. So if we compare then um, this uh, Allure TB test, that's the one that's commercial with the Fujifilm test. This is the data that we published. And basically you can see for people that are HIV positive, the sensitivity uh, goes up uh, quite substantially. And the specificity is perhaps a bit worse, but, but, but also quite high. But to me, what's the most exciting part is actually this HIV negative piece where basically the sensitivity goes from terrible up to actually uh, around 80%. And this specificity remains remains high. So, so this was very encouraging to us. Uh, this, however, is not not yet good enough. Ideally, you want these numbers to be um, ninety nine percent or or as close to that as as you can. And so, of course, this raises the question: is you know, can we do better? And so, we're working now again with our collaborators in a number of directions on this. And so, basically, um, some of the things we're doing to try to identify better receptors are to We've been sitting, now that we know what these these good antibodies seem to be, we've we've been making additional antigens and we've we've been uh, generating antibodies with them, uh, and that's being done with Find as well as a company in the UK called Mologic. We've also been taking the existing antibodies we have and doing affinity maturation, and then we characterize the specificity of those 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 matured antibodies. Uh, we've also been screening antibody libraries. And then we've also been working with, particularly doing this with Jacqueline Ashkar at Albert Einstein, where we, we're isolating uh, lamb-specific B cells from TB patients, both those that are have active TB as well as those that have latent disease, uh, and then trying to understand 
<clears throat> and use those 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 antibodies in these types of tests. Um, it's actually this has actually been very interesting as well from a, from a vaccine perspective, and then we're we're picking up uh, very distinct uh, profiles in terms of antibodies uh, that um, people with latent TB produce are are quite different than uh, antibodies that are produced by people with active TB, and this suggests there may be some insights we can learn here in terms of developing vaccines. Um, so that's the sort of more traditional sort of things we were, we're doing here. You could think about perhaps developing non-protein receptors, so things like aptamers. Um, this is actually being done by others, and in my opinion, it's not super promising, and so we, we, we've not been uh, pursuing that. But what I want to finish off the talk with today is, is uh, some, some work we've been doing uh, with mycobacteriophage proteins, and this is a collaboration with Graham Hatfield in at the University of Pittsburgh. And so Graham is, a, is uh, the world's authority on mycobacteriophages. So what are mycobacteriophages? So I, I sort of mentioned this earlier in the talk, but uh, bacteriophages then are, are uh, bacteriophages are, are viruses that, that infect and kill bacteria. So then mycobacteriophages are, are, are viruses that, that infect mycobacteria. And um, the reported ones to date are all tailed phages that are double-stranded uh, DNA genomes. Uh, and the examples of the, these types of tail phages, they fall into the three families, Cifaviridae, Myoviridae, and Potoviridae. So all of, this, all of the, um, the uh, mycobacteriophages identified so far fall into these first two families. And they're, they're more or less uh, defined by the type of tail they have. So they all have these, these, these heads where, where the DNA is kept. Uh, and then uh, basically they have either a longer sort of more flexible tail, a shorter, um, a shorter tail, uh, or then basically no tail at all. And you'll see they have these sort of feet on them. And these feet then are what are believed to be involved in helping them to bind to the surface of bacteria. So... Uh, in terms of mycobacteriophages, there's a really unique sort of resource that's being created by, by Hatful and his collaborators. Uh, and these are all categorized on a, on a website called phages.db.org. And there's been more than 12,000 mycobacteriophages that have been reported uh, on this website. And so if you're interested in this, I encourage you to visit this website. It's actually really, really very interesting. You can search for a phage. And it will tell you um, tell you what is in some cases what its genome is. It will give you a picture of it, and it will tell you where it was isolated. Um, so they've gone through and we've sequenced uh, now about twenty percent of these gene these these phages, and this has allowed them to put them into different clusters. So there are twenty six different clusters, and there's also several what are called singleton phages. So singletons then are uh, phages that have a, a DNA sequence or genome sequence that's distinct enough from other um, other phages that they don't fall into one of the existing families. So this was this is a lot of work, 12,000 phages. It's a lot of, and the question is how were these was put together? And it was largely built via, via a very nice sort of uh, outreach program, which Graham developed called Phage Hunters Integrating Research and Education. And so this is targeted largely towards high school students and undergraduates. And it's described in this journal of biology paper that I mentioned. And basically, they work with high schools and, and, and predominantly undergrad institutions to go out and collect samples from the environment from which you can then have phage. And so basically, anywhere there's mycobacteria, it's very likely you're going to, fear, you're going to find mycobacteria phages. And so I mentioned earlier in the, in, the, in, the, in the lecture that phages are everywhere, particularly mycobacteria. There's more, most of the mycobacteria are, are present in the soil. And so uh, the soil is a, is a rich source for mycobacteria phages. So for practical reasons, uh, most of these were identified using Mycobacterium smegmatis as the host. And so uh, to, 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 I'll show, explain how, how, we, how you can generate or isolate phages in a minute, but basically you, it, it's easiest to do this if you have a host that's not, not pathogenic, otherwise you have the, the sort of, um, the, the, the regulations are, are very challenging in terms of doing this work on say human pathogens. So uh, one of the sort of interests in, in, in mycobacteriophages and, and is, is the idea to eventually use them in, in what's called phage therapy. And so basically phage therapy is the idea that you apply phages to a, uh, to a patient instead of antibiotics and that that then treats the bacterial infection. And this is not a new idea. This, this has been actually used uh, in certain parts of the world for, for more than a century since phages were really identified about 100 years ago. Its use in, in treating microbacterial diseases is, is relatively recent. And so there was a nice uh, paper that came out in Nature Medicine. And there's since been a couple of more recent papers. 
where they used a cocktail of three mycobacteriophages for treating a, a, a mycobacterium abscessus infection that uh, was an individual that who could not be treated using standard antibiotics. So it's known that other phages bind to viruses, sorry, bind to, bind to bacteria through things on their outer surface, uh, and in particular glycans. And so a question we asked uh, a long time ago really was, do mycobacteriophage phages have glycan binding proteins that perhaps could bind to the surface of, of, of the cell wall? And the answer was yes, and that we, we, we worked with a collaborator, uh, again, about, and published about 10 years ago, a small study where we had, we had taken a protein that had been isolated from one of these phages um, and showed that they bound to some of these arabinose containing compounds. So we wanted to expand upon that. And, and so uh, the idea really was uh, the following. So if you think about um, how a phage lives or mycobacteria phages live and, 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 and propagate um, and the roles of glycans in that process, there are effectively two steps where you think glycans or carbohydrate recognizing enzymes or proteins would be important or glycan binding proteins would be important. The first, as I mentioned, was 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 the, the infection. So here's a mycobacteria. These little colored lines are then uh, possible cell wall glycans. And then the phage, of course, in order to infect the cell, has to first bind to it. So the idea is that these have these receptor binding proteins that could bind. Um, and then you get the phage attached to the bacteria. At that point, the DNA is injected into this, into this, into the bacteria. The bacteria then uh, then takes that 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 genome and then produces more viruses. And then the next thing, of course, is the viruses have to get out. Uh, and the way they do that is they produce proteins called lysins. And these lysins are effectively peptidoglycan hydrolases that then chew apart the cell wall uh, and then allow then the, the phages to be released. Okay. So again, we thought basically there are two places where glycan binding proteins, or proteins could, be, uh, could be identified. One is, of course, in this event. The other is, is, is here in the sense that uh, these lysin A and B proteins, of course, Bind to, bind to peptidoglycan predominantly, and then also catalyze um, uh, the catalysis. So if you if you could then knock out the catalytic function of these, these could be potential peptidoglycan binders, and both of these could be used as diagnostic in, in potential diagnostic kits. So the idea was basically the following. So we had three hypotheses. So one was mycobacteriophages, uh, these RBPs, as, as well as inactivated lysin A and B proteins are potentially useful as reagents in, in, in diagnostics for, for TB. Uh, understanding these mycobacteria features, mycobacteria interactions are, are actually of, of interest and, and possibly could also be used to facilitate phage therapy. For example, if we could identify a phage that selectively targets one particular type of organism over another. And then the last thing that is sort of been something fun that we've been picked up on here is, is, um, is, is Taiwan, of course, like the Philippines is an island. Uh, and uh, Taiwan has a unique sort of ecological niche and a number of unique uh, plant species and, and, and animals. And so we asked the question, to, a very basic question, perhaps a little naive, was do Taiwan, does Taiwan have unique mycobacteria phages? So the idea was basically the approach here on this is, is to continue to make antigens for the array, as I mentioned, uh, but then to take the sequences of the known phages and then do analysis of those to mine for potential glycan binding proteins produce those using recombinant technology, and then screen those on the array. If we had data from the, from the glycan array, then we can do additional structural biology to understand the, the interactions of the glycans with these structures, and then also then uh, possibly incorporate these into diagnostics. So that's sort of the first sort of two of those three, addresses the first two or three of those hypotheses. The last one then was uh, we wanted to, to screen then phages directly on the array. Uh, and we wanted to include both phages, not only our own phages, but also phages that come from Taiwan. So to talk first about our efforts to, to try to identify uh, some uh, proteins that bind to phages and also phages binding to, binding to uh, the array. So we spent a lot of time trying to make this work and been able to get some success finally. So here are a couple of ray experiments. And again, on the, on the y-axis is the, the intensity of the signal and then the different glycans are shown here at the bottom. So what you see is that some, many don't bind at all, but we do have some, some that bind. And these are two different proteins. One is called BXB19 and this is BXB130. Um, and they, they have sort of very grossly similar profiles. So this is a phage that was isolated from the Bronx in 1990. So it's actually one of the older phages in the collection. 
Um, and basically, if you look at what the major binders are, it's these structures here. And so uh, these are fairly large, these are large fragments. Um, and basically, these are structure related to lamb. And so this that these popped out was encouraging to me in the sense that it's known that the outer surface of this organism has lamb and it's binding to lamb like fragments. So that was that was very encouraging. To get this data with the proteins, of course, it takes a lot of work. You've got to express the proteins. You've got to then, uh, and, and, and that takes time. And not all proteins express so well. And so there's, it's, it's a fairly laborious process. And so we wanted to see if we could speed this up by just simply looking directly at the phages and seeing if the phages would bind. And there's, oh, sorry, I should mention that. Um, sorry, that we, we've, 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 spe we've seen similar specificity with proteins from these other phages as well. Um, and here you'll start to get a sense of, of some of the phages. So every phage has a name. Um, and uh, so, and then the names are basically given by the person who identified the, the phage. And if you go to phages.db, you'll see that there's, there's, they have a name and then there's often a description as to why that phage was named that way. Um, and so these then also give you some sense of the, the distribution. So Kamau is a singleton, Faith is from cluster L, uh, Nanosmite from cluster M and patients from cluster U, and then BXB is from cluster A. Um, okay. So we wanted again to look at <laughs> the binding of the whole phage. And the, the, there's an important technical challenge here, and that when, when you do an ELISA type experiment, for example, with an antibody, is relatively straightforward because you have your array and then you put your you put your first protein down, for example, on a monoclonal. And then you go into the secondary antibody that has some sort of label on it. And that technology is very well established and you can buy all of the appropriate secondary reagents that are, that are labeled appropriately. All phages are different. And so there's no universal antiphage reagent that you can use to detect. And so to do this, then what we do is we, we have to use chemical labeling. So we take the phage and then we react it with, it with a dye. And so in this case, we used Alexa 4532, which is a green dye. So that then gives us phages that are then fluorescently labeled, and these indeed are they're they're green when you when you when you look at them. <clears throat> but then we can do the, the array experiment. And so, of course, one of the limitations here is we're not necessarily sure that the the, the labeling of the dye with the dye uh, what that does to the binding capability. But um, in other studies, people have done this type of approach in terms of uh, using phages and showing where they go. In, in the environment, and it's they seem to tolerate this reasonably well, although their their infectivity is generally dropped. Um, but when we look at this, basically we see uh, now this is the whole phage base we want, and we see patterns that look sort of similar to the data I showed you earlier. And basically, if you look at the things that bind uh, predominantly, what you see is that again these are all the same generally the same type of molecules, these large uh, glycans. Okay, and so. This is encouraging again that, that we seem to be picking up the same compounds. Where we're heading with this then is to try to better characterize the binding of these proteins and these phages with these glycans using other biochemical, uh, biophysical methods. All right, so I'll finish off then here with just uh, some of the work we'll be doing on trying to identify new phages. And this has been sort of a fun thing uh, to do that we've, we've um, really was spearheaded by one a very, very talented master student who wanted to do something a bit different and she, she thought this would be fun. So in order to generate pages, what we do is we simply go out and we collect soil from 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 um, from various places in Taiwan. And so the way this typically worked is that uh, when someone would go home from for a vacation uh, in Taiwan, my the student would give her friend in the lab uh, three to four vials, of, and they would take them home and collect samples in their hometown. We also went on a small group trip last summer and collected a number of samples. The idea is you come back, you have a falcon tube here that's sort of half full of dirt. You add phage, you your phage by buffer, you you, you extract, uh, and then you filter, and then you take the 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 the, the solution, and then you apply that to a to a plate. Um, and if there are uh, uh, so if there are phages there, they infect the bacteria, the cells will lice, and that leads then to these dark spots on the background of a of a petri uh, petri dish. You can then isolate that phages and then grow them up. So here's a plate where you have uh, a number of uh, different plaques. So these are the phages and then um, and further amplify that. And then you need to isolate them. And the way you do that is using cesium chloride uh, ultra centrifugation. And so this is a band here that you see of the, this is the phages. So you can isolate that band. And then from there, if you want to do a genome sequencing, you can then do an extraction using uh, phenyl uh, chloroform 
and uh, isopropanol. And from here, then we do one of two things. So uh, we um, do sequencing using next generation sequencing, and then we can go through the usual process of doing annotation of these. We also characterize using restriction enzyme digests. And so this is again what this looks like. And so um, using different um, di different uh, restriction enzymes, um, each phage, if they're different, then we'll give you then kind of a unique pattern here. And then we also can do transmission electron micro microscopy of these phages. So, so here are two examples of two uh, phages from Taiwan. So this is a myoviridae. Again, you can sort of see it has a short uh, tail that's, that's rigid. And the sifoviridae then has uh, basically a longer tail that, that's, that's more flexible. In this case, it's sort of curved. Okay. So, so far then, we've, we've, we've collected samples from all around Taiwan. We've collected about 600 samples, and we've gotten about a, a 92, we've gotten about oh, just over 90 phages. So that's a, a hit rate of about 16%, which is actually higher than we anticipated. Um, and so these came from all around the country. Um, most of them have come from Hualien. So we, we went on a group trip last summer. Uh, we, it's, it's about a two hour trip from Taipei where, where, where Academia Seneca is. And then we spent a day and a half uh, going to different sites in, in Taiwan or in, in Hawaii and trying to collect samples. And um, so at the end of the day, we had nearly, uh, well, over 400, nearly 500, 450 samples from Hawaii from that trip. Um, so we've been able to sequence those 17. And so basically these are uh, the phages that we have. And so uh, here, what I list are the different phages, and so you'll see each of them have different names, and the, the names were all given by by this the student uh, or person who isolated it. I don't know the why they were named all days, except for for this one, Digitog, which is one I isolated, and this actually uh, uh, was is the name of our dog. Um, what you see is that these are all put in phage clusters. Uh, this was a little bit disappointing in the sense that we'd hoped we'd find something that was a bit different. Um, so far, we haven't, although I'd argue that we've only looked at a very small number of these, and it could be that in the other roughly 70 or so phages that we have that we may find, uh, 75 phages, we may find some different different types of uh, structures or different types of phages. So we're there, so we're starting to identify these, uh, and the next step is to try to then look at their glycan binding properties. Uh, and then we're also now uh, doing some uh, more structural work. And so this is a, one of the phages that was isolated from the town south of Taipei. Um, and this was named after the, the dog of the student who uh, collected it. So here's what you typically see. And this is a sip of verde. And so here's the head of the phage head, which contains a nucleic acid. And then here's the tail. You can't really see the, the part that, uh, that interacts with the, the, the legs here very well. And this this. So this is a standard sort of electromicrograph, and we've also been able to do cryo EM of this to try to get a more high profile or high, high resolution structure. And so then this is, for example, again, the phage. <clears throat> and now we can get really in detail pictures of this now. So we have the capsid head here, which is uh, at around four angstrom resolution, the tail, which is actually nearly three angstrom resolution, um, and, the place, and then the, the base plate, which is around five. So these, you know, these are pretty good resolutions. We're trying to improve this, and then the the connector, which is the piece between the 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 head and the tail, is a little lower resolution. So we now have the genome sequence of this, and so in principle, then what we can do is actually develop really high profile or high resolution structures of these uh, using the actual sequences. All right, so I'm going to stop there um, and just thank the people who who did that. So basically, this is sort of a story of this that started a long time ago and 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 where we, we made a bunch of compounds, we developed this array, and now we're trying to do something which I think is will be hopefully long term more impactful. Um, so this is this is my group uh, that this picture was taken last summer. So the key people involved in this project on the uh, on the array experiments then uh, were these individuals and the phages. Uh, so um, basically Lian was the, the master student who uh, has been sort of spearing this project. Uh, and then the key people on this are, are actually three Filipinos, uh, Yao Makali, uh, uh, Joe Mark Narciso, and Ronnie Perez, who's been involved in doing some of the binding measurements. The stuff I talked about at the very beginning, where, where we were talking about the proteins the, and, the, and the diagnostic, leading to the diagnostic, that was all done in Edmonton by uh, uh, Blanjung, who's a who's a uh, research assistant, uh, or a technician. 
this is a highly collaborative project. So my group has basically done all the synthesis of the glycans. And we've also been involved in, in the array studies and measuring the, the bindings. Um, and uh, I tried to mention, so the people as we went along, we work with people at Rutgers and at Find, uh, Albert Einstein and Melogic. The page work has really been doing a large, larger, we've been getting tons of help from Graham. Uh, the structural work at the end here is being done by a collaborator at, uh, at, at Academia Seneca. And uh, Seneca has great core facilities. And so we've, we've been using both the, the NGS uh, core as well as the Cryum core. So with that, then I'll stop and I'll be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Thad. So um, any questions from the audience? Oh, Al Serafika, yes, you raise your hand. Um, you can stop sharing now, Dad, if you want. Okay. Yes, Al. Yeah. Thanks, Todd, for taking the time to uh, describe your work to us in the Philippines. We've been interacting with Academica Seneca, actually, with Giselle Conception, who was president of PASE for detection of COVID, probably as early mm -hmm. as 2020. And uh, at that point, I was also part of a group that was trying to convert our gene expert machines here uh, for, uh, okay. uh, for being right. able to detect. This, they, there were 600 of them when we only had like one RT-PCR or three RT-PCRs. There were 600 okay. gene expert machines that were used for TB hmm. detection. So, I see. Interesting. Uh, okay. uh, so we, we tried to uh, contact Cephi, uh, the manufacturer in San Francisco. Uh, to right. convert their cartridges into COVID. But now they've since reverted back to the TV, which is funded by the Global Fund. My question is more on your detection for TV. Uh, are they ready for prime time? Uh, because definitely here in, uh, in the Philippines, we do have uh, a resurgence because of COVID. And I'm looking, uh, I was part of the CN Diagnostic Hub with ASTAR. And uh, of course, malaria, TB, and dengue are top detector aspects right. that we always looked at. And for me, part of my interest is to be able to deploy working uh, uh, models, and of course, that are cost-effective and deployable in very uh, minimal uh, environments with hardly any. Uh, clearly, uh, your your lamb uh, 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 detection which is not used for HIV. Uh, do you have a light mediated type uh, similar technology, lab technology that you think will so, be so? Yeah, yeah. So the bottom line is, it's, it's, it's still still not ready for prime time in the sense that it's still being it's still being developed and and further validated. And so I know that find and again, you know, all the all the screening was not done in my lab. So just to be clear, the find uh, I know has has sent out an RFP for, uh, and this was a couple of years ago for uh, basically trying to better better validate this in 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 the in the real world so um and i i have how long how long do you think that it will, will take for before a, a, a lamp technology will be out there for a <laughs> yeah I, I don't i i don't i can't give you an answer i that i don't know so uh, uh, nice, nice try out <laughs> you, you can just say that <laughs> so, okay. so I, I yeah so but it, it is it is being further validated i don't know and 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 uh I need to follow up with people to try to understand what it, I get asked this question a lot, so I, sh I should probably I should probably get an answer to what what their estimate of the timeline is. So yeah, because part of the uh, the discussion that we had with Academic Seneca at that time is they provide the active uh, either the monoclonal or yeah. the, uh, the the detection uh, systems. We put them in kits here. We have lamp capability anyway here, and then we yeah, go. So yes, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah, look forward to uh, uh, an update to Gladys. I mean, definitely Paase uh, is here. And again, part of the advantage of being in the Philippines and in the US for 25 years, but since I came back here, part of our uh, mantra is being able to approach the field where it's needed. So any technological advances in the first world or in uh, more advanced economies, we can definitely mm -hmm. field test it and have clinical yeah. validation as well. So thanks Todd again, and I will probably yeah. help you. Head out, but thank you for taking the time and look forward to more uh, interactions. I know uh, there's a Taiwanese delegation coming here in about a week, a week's time. Oh, really? Okay. So uh, I think uh, hopefully uh, uh, we'll look back uh, with, with, with all of you guys in, in Taiwan. But thank you very much for your time. Okay.
Okay. Thank you, Al. So I have a follow-up question about the TV project. Okay, so you you showed the results that is more sensitive with HIV negative, right? Mm -hmm. Compared to HIV positive, what's the re reason for that? I, I think I think it's just a matter of that the antibodies are higher affinity, and so it can detect it can detect smaller amounts of the material, and so that's that's the hypothesis. So. Um, you know what's interesting is the 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 Allure test, as far as I know, well, it's not known what it actually. It's not known what it binds to. Basically, there's no idea. We haven't. We're, we're the only people that has this array, and so it, no one's actually looked to see what it binds to. And the affinity, I guess, is not known either for for any of these. And so we've not measured affinities, but um, some, the homologic group that we're looking at is using lamb to measure affinities. So these and these, anti, these antibodies are actually quite high affinity. They're really sort of uh, sort of in the low, low micromolar range, even even high nanomolar range. And so um, the argument is that it's just more specific and more because it's higher affinity. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, one more, sorry. Um, did you try just the disaccharide for your MPX? Oh uh, no, we don't have any just a disaccharide on that on the on the on the plate, um, and we haven't tried anything where we, you know, tried to compete it off with a disaccharide. I, I suspect, and the things we've also made have been larger. They've been things that had sort of five to six residues with the MTX at the at the at the back end. So, yeah. Uh, any uh, okay? There's a question here from. Ruel, he in the chat box. Ruel, do you want to read it? All right, I can. I guess everyone can see. There's also one before that. Perhaps I'll address the other one first. So, okay. Yes. Uh, first comment more on the differences in antibody between those patients of latent. Yeah. So, so this is work I didn't talk about. I just hinted at. So, so basically, what we what's what's interesting is we've so. What they do is they 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 take these B cells from various patients who've had TB, and then they isolate the ones that react with lamb, and then we carry and they generate the monoclonal, and then we screen. And what's coming out of this is that people with latent TB actually have certain antibodies that there are that bind seem to bind to completely different parts of the lamb, and don't bind to these very the apitopes like I showed today that are typically at the at the at the termini and the caps. Yeah, and so uh, so that that's basically the message here and that's that that's we don't understand why that's the case but it suggests that perhaps um that those are the those are better epitopes to go after in terms of of vaccinations so that's the that's the that's the conclusion so far um all right so the other ones from Ruel then so so sputum and so aside from sputum and are there attempts to develop tb diagnostic using blood yeah, sure. Uh, that's that approach has been used. Um, the the disadvantage of using that is simply that that it's a more invasive technique, right? And you need you need something more sophisticated than than say just spitting into a cup or peeing into a cup. And there's actually been a really nice paper that came out just a couple of weeks ago in Nature uh, Nature Communications where they're using uh, exhaled breath condensates. So basically, people just breathe, breathe into into a into a, a container and then that that condenses. Remarkably, actually, there's lamb in that uh, lamb in that that condensate. So that's actually for for people who are TB positive, uh, and those also have some unusual glycan structures in there. So it was just published in in, in Nature Communications. So uh, in general, I think there's a movement to try to go to 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 very easily accessible things that don't require any sort of uh, you know relatively sophisticated uh, medical technology like a, like a, like a needle. Um, number two, as I already addressed, is that the Fujifilm test available and it, 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 not yet. Um, <clears throat> and the the turnaround, I, I mean, this is a lateral flow test. So basically it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's a rapid test. So, you know, it's the same as if you were like, well, I, I suppose everyone on this call has taken at least one rapid, rapid COVID test, right? So it was 15 to 20 minutes, I think is, is the timeline. Okay, other questions from the audience? Okay, so while waiting for other questions, I have a quick question about your microbiologist um, project, Todd. So you, um, I, you showed that you have already isolated around 17, so, but you didn't discuss how to really the, the process of isolating and purify it. So is it a long process or? Well, yeah, so it takes, 
probably to go from from once you well the, the early infection thing is is pretty straightforward basically that's that's a couple of days uh, and so you know you 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 can go from a soil sample into knowing if you have a phage on a plate in usually about two days, um, and the, the the you know the 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 lice the the extraction with the buffer and the filtration is easy, and then you once if you have the if you have the the agar plates with the with um, with the smegmatis on it, then you just basically put the put the the lysate on there, and then you you incubate and wait. So that that's all pretty fast. Growing it up, then I think in total takes. To do that, I think they can do usually. Uh, it's about a week, I think, to get to get to the to the week or ten days to get to the um, to the 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 the, the band that has the uh -huh. you know the the season forward band. So it's not super fast, but also not not super time consuming either. And it's, it's not it's a little bit straightforward. And how much soil do you need? Do you use? Um, yeah, so, so like if we take a. 50, 50 mil falcon tube of half full, and so um, so so you can, you can also collect from water. Uh, the problem is that you just need a lot more water, and it becomes a lot more you have to concentrate, and it, it, that's a lot harder to do, right? And so so we we focus more on soil, uh, just because it's it's easier to get, and and, uh, and you want to find somewhere that's typically sort of moist and. Uh, it, it rains a lot in, in Taiwan, so it's that's not a hard not a hard uh, thing to find usually. Um, so I mean, obviously, I mean, I would think if you go to phages.db, I don't think any of them any of the phages there are from from the Philippines either. So I, I suspect this would be something that it could easily be done in the Philippines. Yeah. and it's you know, re a relatively low 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 right. intensity type of work. Um, I guess for me, the, the 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 question is, you know, it's fun. It's this is sort of fun to do, but at some point you've got to you've got to come up with some sort of bigger impact work than just developing pages and so we're hoping then that we can we can identify some something new um and uh, also start to make them put them into use somewhere yes yeah, so Ruel, you raise your hand you have a question uh, yes uh just a simple question so you mentioned that uh, uh the the usual synthesis uh using the the lab approach or the chemoenzymatic approach is a uh, major disadvantage for the preparation of your uh, ligands mm. um, for this test. Um, how about using a automated uh, oligosaccharide synthesizer? <coughs> possible? Yeah, up? sure. Yeah, so I mean, we we actually we actually have uh, we have one of these uh, automated oligosaccharide synthesizers. Um, uh, I would say that's. They're, 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 the first disadvantage of that machine is it's they're they're expensive. They're still very very expensive. It's it's much more expensive than a peptide synthesizer. Uh, the second thing is that there's some we discovered there it, that's a machine that although it's commercial still has a lot of bugs, um, and um, uh, well I'll, I'll leave it at that. I don't want to be too too negative. It's it's we're st struggling to get that up and running, frankly, and. Uh, and so I suspect, you know, my, my group has a lot of experience in making oligosaccharides, and I, I suspect if we're struggling, that 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 a lot of other groups are going to struggle, particularly those who don't have this, the expertise. And it's a significant outlay. The price is around, it's about 300,000, 350,000 euros. So, I mean, it, it's it's expensive. So. Thank you. Okay. Any other question from the audience? All right, I think that's it. Okay, well, again, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, hopefully people got something from that. And uh, if people want to follow up with more questions, you're welcome to email me. And uh, uh, again, thanks for the invitation, Gladys. Yes, um, um, we're not just done. We want to present a certificate of appreciation to you, Todd. Okay. Thank you very much. And you are always welcome to visit us here in UPLB. He was actually just here. Todd was here um, last <coughs> Wednesday. So um, let me just present, all right. Okay, so um, we, the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering would like to present this certificate of appreciation to you, Todd Laurie, for graciously sharing your expertise with your talk entitled Glycan Arrays Diagnostics and Mycobacteria Phages during this PASE webinar held today, 27th day of January, 2023 
signed by our president, Mariano Santo Domingo. Again, um, thank you very much, Dad, for, for taking time to present your recent work. It's, it's exciting, and hopefully we can visit you also here in, yes. um, um, in the... Uh, we can we can visit you in Taiwan. I just want to mention that um, actually you Tad did a post the with you did a post that yeah, yeah, you did a post that with yeah. Martin, Martin Medell, who just got who had uh, who got a Nobel Prize in chemistry. So so stay don't retire yet, Tad. Who knows? <laughs> Well, yeah, well, okay. I should also mention that the work I did with Morton had nothing to do with the Nobel Prize. But, but thank you for, for mentioning that. Yeah, and then because Caroline Bertosi already got a Nobel Prize, so still stay, yeah. okay? And who knows? I'm not worried, about, I'm not worried about that. That's not, that's not one of my goals. <laughs> so, but thank you. Yeah, thank okay. you very much. Yes, and then um, I'd like just to share a screen. I want to, uh, oh no, just continue. I, I think. Um, um, Fab, can you go to the next page? Yes, um, I just want to announce the next webinar that PAAS is sponsoring this next week. is um, in collaboration with UPMASA. Okay, and um, the speaker is Dr. Irma Makalinao from the University of the Philippines Manila College of Medicine. Again, every month we have a different theme. So for this, for January, it's for good health and well-being. So the next talk is entitled preparedness for chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear disasters. Please um, try to join. Um, you can see here, you, you can register using that website or you can just use the QR code. And next month, we have another activity. Uh, oh, we have also, um, after that, we have this fellowship meeting and STEAM matching. This is with 11 Taiwanese universities, um, TAD. So, we have a symposium with a, with several Taiwanese universities, and this will be on February 11, 2023. For PAASI members, if you would like to join us, please let us know right away because we're uh, we need to send them the list. This um this is an opportunity to uh, um, discuss with several Taiwanese universities if you want to collaborate with some of them, and also several the um, SUCs will be there. Okay, to give them chance to uh, meet with other Taiwanese universities. And the next activity, yes. Okay, so this will be the first face-to-face -face, um, activity that we will have this year. The, uh, uh, no, the second rather, that STEAM um, meeting matching is also face-to-face. -face. So this will be the Global Women's Breakfast 2023. We've been doing this for the past two years, but virtually, and now we will be holding this at UPLS Banos at the Continuing Education Center. And we have two speakers, Dr. Esther Albano Garcia, the um, former president of the University of the East. She just recently re retired last December 2022. And our, our PAASI secretary, Dr. Lourdes Herald. So these are the activities. Is there another um, activity that I... I will show Feb. Okay, so that's it. And then again, uh, Mario, do you want to invite them again for the for this third APAMS? Of course, yeah. I'll just repeat myself. Uh, we would like to invite everyone to uh, uh, submit abstracts for the uh, 43rd uh, annual PAAS meeting and symposium. You may uh, submit an abstract for online or uh, or uh, poster presentation or oral presentation, or you can submit the, an abstract for uh, on-site presentation in Orlando, Florida. Please go to paase.org for more information. Salamat po. Yes, Dad, can you open your video? We need to have a photo for a photo opportunity. Okay. Okay, smile, and then for the, and then we will include the rest of the audience. Thank you, Al, and everybody. Can you please open your videos so that we can take a picture? Ayan. Dr. Movillon, thank you for always attending our webinars. She's been always present on Mario Simam. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dan. 
see and more right here. Naka gallery ba? Ayan. They are, these are my students and my colleagues. Thank you for attending. This was a very good attendance. We had 120 registrants and then usually it's 25%, but we got 50% um, attendees. So this is a good start. More. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cabellion, for coming, Dr. Billy. So Dr. Billy is the sponsor of the UPMASA, UPMASA um, webinar. Okay. And all of this without their faces are my RAs. I don't know why they're not showing their <laughs> faces. Okay. And my previous students, thank you for attending. And from different SUCs, Dr. Ariola is here. She's also a carbohydrate chemist, analytical carbohydrate. And you met, uh, no, this is Dr. Desiree Aldemita, um, also our faculty member. Who else? Lahat na ba na picture Again, thank you very much po for those who attended, not from EPLB and not from Paase. We really would like to encourage non paasi members to attend our webinars. Again, okay, that's it po. Tama ba? Tapos na, Feb? Okay. So, Mario will meet, no? After? Again, thank, thanks a lot, Todd. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank you, Todd. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll see. Bye-bye. Natapos nga bang picture ni ano? Ni, ni Feb? I think so. I think so. Oh, okay, ano? Ang ganda. Ang daming. Yeah, yes. Yes. And it's, yeah. Uh, oh my gosh. Can uh, you a little more. <laughs> okay, let's just wait for them to. Ang Feb, natapos ba? Lahat pa picture Ang dami mo pala. Yes. Po. Oh, 65. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. So, ayun. Yay! And then next, kailan ba? Yeah, the next. 30th. So, uh, 30th. it's Monday, right? That's right? Yeah, Monday. Monday yon pala. So, Tuesday. Oh, Sunday evening. Oh, oh, okay. So, we have to attend kasi kasa. <laughs> yeah. Tama tayo. And then. Oh, so, uh, yeah. Let's just wait for them to leave, Siguro. Or Siguro, you can move.